So uh, the title of my talk might be a little confusing to some of you. What is this Wanamaker problem I speak of? Uh, I wrote a, a paper along with Julie and Colin Hill and uh, Mike Lukides uh, about how data science can transform healthcare. And we started with uh, some big ideas from Silicon Valley that we think will shape the future of healthcare. I'm not a healthcare guy. Uh, I'm somebody who's been part of the Silicon Valley scene for many years and have thought a lot about technology trends. And I really want to explore how some of those ideas uh, come together. And they start uh, with this notion uh, that uh, department store magnate John Wanamaker first uttered in the 1890s, where he said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. Now, you guys probably can see immediately the relevance of that notion to healthcare. Uh, but we had a revolution on the consumer internet with pay-per-click advertising models, which were uh, really driven to success by Google through amazing power of predictive analytics and new business models that allowed people to start paying only for advertising that worked. And that revolution is still rippling through the media landscape. But it's my belief that it's also central to almost everything we're talking about in healthcare. Now, if you look at, first of all, not, not the clinical side, but the business side, uh, the whole notion of accountable care is a lot uh, focused on let's pay for what works instead of just paying for doing stuff. Very similar to the idea that we used to just pay for ad impressions, and now we pay for ac actions that people take in response to those ads. Uh, Chris Saka, who was uh, the head of special projects at Google, now an investor in, in little companies like Facebook, uh, said, what I learned from Google is to only invest in things that close the loop. And that notion of closing the loop with data is central uh, both to reforming the payment side of our healthcare system, but also uh, to getting more out of the clinical side. Now, the popularization of this idea really began a few years ago. Atul Gawande, uh, a physician and a brilliant writer, has been banging this drum in The New Yorker. Uh, we hear stories uh, like his one about the healthcare hotspotting, uh, Jeffrey Brenner's work in Camden, New Jersey, figuring out which patients uh, really are driving the most cost in the healthcare system, targeted intervention driven by data, uh, you know, analysis uh, even before that of how the the um, most expensive uh, care in America is not the best. The, if, if anything, the, there's a, a negative correlation between the cost of care and the quality of care. Um, but it's kind of interesting because Gawande himself as a physician is part of a uh, hospital system in Massachusetts that according to uh, the state of Massachusetts uh, has used its monopoly power to extract effectively monopoly rents from the, from the uh, healthcare system. And they had this study where they said price increases, uh, not increases in utilization, caused most of the increases in health care during the past few years in Massachusetts. Higher priced hospitals are gaining market share at the expense of lower priced hospitals, which are losing volume. The commercial health care marketplace has been distorted by contracting practices that reinforce and perpetuate disparities in pricing. Now, so there's still, even with the attempts to reform the system, uh, there's still something that's very, very difficult that we're going to have to keep managing. You know, we kind of hear, what are we learning from uh, the Massachusetts experiment that will be applied to the national experiment? And one of the things that we learn is uh, that we actually need to regulate the self-interested actors who are trying to extract money from the system. Uh, Paul Levy, who used to run Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, uh, wrote a blog post recently uh, where he said, a friend of mine jokingly said, what's all this talk about the US healthcare system being inefficient? We consider that the system was designed to transfer money from consumers to the various parts of the healthcare industry. We're twice as effective as the world average. Right? Why would we expect that a free enterprise health system uh, would do anything other than maximize transfers of this sort? And that's what we see from the Massachusetts experiment. So the issue here is that we need to start thinking about actually feedback loops and what I call algorithmic regulation in the healthcare market. You know, the way we normally do these things is we set uh, the uh, reimbursement rates uh, at a glacial pace. Uh, we, we don't look at the data. We don't look at the outcomes. There's a beginning of that process, but it has to increasingly move in real time. Um, 
and you have to actually think about the values. Paul had another great post uh, where he talked about how you can go wrong with incentives. And he said, you have to have a clear sense that the metric to be measured is determinative of the results sought. You have to ensure that the recipient of the financial payment or debit controls the workflow associated with the metric. You have to be confident that the recipient is likely to be influenced in the correct direction, so on. Uh, great thinking. Uh, but the point is, we're just at the beginning of rethinking how we manage the healthcare system. And there are great lessons from the way that uh, companies like Google have built algorithmic regulation systems for search quality, or companies uh, like credit card companies have, have do fraud detection in real time. Uh, and the secret is this real time measurement of outcomes. And it's also building what Eric Ries, the author of an amazing book, not about healthcare, but about running a business called The Lean Startup, calls uh, the build, measure, learn feedback loop. Eric has this notion that rather than designing vast systems in advance, uh, they're probably wrong. You want to develop the minimum viable product uh, that will teach you something about what the market really wants. And then you actually you measure, you do measurement, you get, gain the data, you expand, you continuously deploy an improved product. There's a lot for healthcare to learn in this model. And of course, a big part of what makes that go is data science. This is a little uh, booklet we published uh, at O'Reilly called Building Data Science Teams. The graph on the right shows the demand uh, as shown by, by LinkedIn for the bundle of skills that they call data scientists. This is going to be a huge part of healthcare's future and, and of course the reason. Now I want to jump away from payment reform to personalized medicine. Now in this room uh, there's probably a, a lot more uh, medical knowledge than I'll ever have. I'm not going to focus on the healthcare aspects of this or the clinical aspects or the scientific aspects, but on the social aspects of what needs to change from personalized medicine to work. Now, we heard from Jamie about patients like me and from uh, Anne about uh, 23 and Me. Both of these are incredible social experiments. And, you know, M uh, Mark Zuckerberg likes to talk about how we need to change our attitudes towards privacy and sharing. But he's talking about it uh, at a much more trivial level. This is, is about life-changing stuff that really matters, where sharing can uh, make an incredible difference to, to understanding what we know and how to use uh, the information that we have that's currently locked up in silos. Uh, so I, I really consider sites like this the epicenter of the real social revolution that is just beginning to hit our, our society. I'm going to talk about people owning your own data. We heard earlier about the Blue Button Initiative from the VA, which now a uh, uh, wonderful lesson here is the lesson of simplicity. Uh, they just cut the Gordian knot and said, we're just going to put out this data in the simplest possible format. And we will let the market figure out how to build better interfaces to that data. And that's been a huge start. Uh, there's one problem, though. It turns out, and this is highlighted in a recent New York Times uh, article, it turns out, and, and uh, this is brought to our attention by Ann Walder, who I believe is here in the room, uh, that there is a, uh, a problem in harmonizing federal law, uh, which gives people uh, the right to their test results, uh, with state law, which in many cases does not. And this is apparently a proposed regulation, uh, which has just got to be finalized, uh, to, make, uh, to harmonize these laws and to make it possible for individuals to get their lab test results as well as other kinds of medical records. And so because this is sort of somehow stuck in the system, we decided uh, that we're working with Anne to uh, actually put together a public letter asking Kathleen Sebelius to finalize this, uh, this new ruling. And uh, we'd like you uh, to sign. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a URL uh, which you can get uh, afterwards online. Hopefully, somebody will be tweeting it. Uh, but we also have, I believe, in the uh, um, exhibit hall, we have a place where you can sign a physical copy of this letter. We already have hundreds of high, uh, uh, highly qualified signatories. We'd love to have you add your names to the list. I want to jump to another topic, the quantified self movement. 
This is kind of the, 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 all the crazy people. Literally, there's a conference with thousands of people who are measuring all kinds of things about themselves. And they're, they're interesting startups. This is uh, actually an OATV, O'Reilly Alpha Tech Ventures portfolio company, RunKeeper, which now integrates data from not just uh, people running and using their smartphone, but from the Wi-Fi scale or the Fitbit or the Zio sleep monitor into kind of like a personal data uh, record. Uh, this kind of stuff is kind of seems like a toy, but guess what? You remember when people like Ken Olson, the head of Digital Equipment Corporation, said the PC is just a toy. It turns out that a whole lot of things started out just being toys. There's the first Apple I built by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. It was a toy. They were kids who thought, wow, this is so cool. I could have my own computer. And these people who were saying, wow, I'm going to measure stuff about myself, a lot of it is silly, but some of it is awesome. And it's indicative of an incredible trend, which is that innovation you know, really starts not just with entrepreneurs, but with people having fun who believe in an impossible future. And the fact that there are so many people who are starting to monitor and measure themselves tells us something really important about the future of healthcare. I also want to talk a little bit about platforms. And this is really key with open data. You guys remember what smartphones or what any phone used to be like. It was a, had a few applications. Apple made this amazing decision to turn the phone into a platform. All of a sudden, you have hundreds of thousands of applications. This is the future that we're looking for in healthcare. When we, we actually have all this data, it becomes part of a shared platform, and we start to have companies start to innovate against that data. Now, when you're talking about those kinds of innovations, I want to talk about interface. And Jen Polka, who's the founder of Code for America, said something really wonderful in a speech recently about government. She said, what have we felt about government the way we feel about our iPhones? You know, we love our iPhones. We're happy to pay for them. And the fact that we, we don't feel good about government is partly a reflection of the fact that we don't like the interfaces. And, and Scott Silverman, who's a Code for America fellow, they, they come and work with cities, said, I believe that interfaces to government can be simple, beautiful, and easy to use. And I think, God, how relevant is that to healthcare? You know, what if interfaces for both doctors and patients were simple, beautiful, and easy to use? That's an incredible part of this uh, opportunity to transform healthcare through data, because data is a huge part of the interfaces to the applications of the future. When I talk about interfaces, you might think, oh, I'm talking about the iPhone and the iPad, and oh yeah, we're going to have these smartphone apps, and we'll get the iPad into you know, doctor's offices. Yeah, but that's not really the point. The real secret of thinking about interfaces is to think about workflow. Good example consumer site like ZocDoc, which simplifies the process of uh, finding a doctor, making an appointment. I had a, an experience recently, the first and only time I've used this. I was going on a trip. I actually needed uh, to get something done before I left. I could not make it to my regular doctor back up in Sebastopol. I found a doctor uh, on the route between my meeting at Google in the morning and my flight at the airport in the afternoon, was able to make the appointment, get the, you know, the checkup done, and what a wonderful ex changed experience of healthcare, which of course means that having that database of doctors and so on uh, is a big part of the background of that. Or this is another O'Reilly Alpha Tech Ventures uh, uh, investment a company called Sherpa, uh, Jay Parkinson's uh, New York City startup, which is trying to build uh, a new set of interfaces uh, to doc between doctors and patients uh, through a kind of concierge service uh, uh, that's, that really gives people immediate email uh, access to their physician uh, throughout the day as they have problems. People are starting to rethink, rethink the workflow between doctors and patients. Another uh, interesting uh, company in that space is one that's just started up called Health Loop, uh, which is focuses on the ability of doctors to follow up with their patients after they see them in the office, you know, because sometimes just that simple conversation, you know, are you having swelling? Is the swelling going down? Um, you know, may, may completely transform uh, the experience both for the patient and uh, the outcomes uh, that, that both doctor and patient are looking for. So when you think about interfaces, it's not just technology. It's really rethinking workflow. And again, going back to that lean startup notion, it's also finding the data that will help you to understand the workflows, that will help you to transform uh, how you interact, uh, how you build new interfaces to the system. So uh, new interfaces. Uh, you guys probably seen this uh, uh, Google project, Google Glass. There's Sergey Brin wearing these things with the heads-up display. The reason I bring this up is because 
I think the tablet and phone model is not the end game here. Uh, you know, you can start to think about people really uh, having access to information all the time in much less obtrusive ways. And you see this, this is still at the smartphone level, but think about the Apple uh, store, how you have these salespeople with superpowers. You know, if you've ever bought something in an Apple store, it's kind of astonishing. You walk in, you hand them, uh, you tell them what you want, they, get it, they hand it to you, they put a sticker on it, they, they, they so scan it, and they email you a receipt, and you walk out. Uh, total transformation of the retail clerk. Uh, I was talking with Todd Park, the former uh, CTO of the Department of Health and Human Services and now the federal CTO, and he, he was like, yeah, that's actually what we're going to need for home health care. We're going to have augmented uh, you know, home health care workers who are made smart and powerful in the same way that Apple Store clerks have been made from this low-skill job into this superpower-enabled uh, uh, you know, uh, person who can transform your experience, building an interface to the system that's simple, beautiful, and easy to use. So I want to close uh, with this lesson from Steve Jobs. Uh, because it's really worth thinking about. He talked about design. He said in most people's vocabularies, design means veneer. It's interior decorating. It's the fabric of the curtains and the sofa. But to me, design is the fundamental soul of a man-made creation that ends up expressing itself in successive outer layers of the product or service. Now, that is our opportunity. Carol was just talking about this, this opportunity to reinvent the healthcare system, to actually figure out how to do it right and express it through successive layers of service, application, interaction, workflow. And we need to make that reinvention be driven by data. And I think that's why you're all here. So uh, keep doing what you do. Let's make a revolution together. Thank you very much.